Well, we'll continue this series today. We have had, well, I've had a great time going through this, this series entitled Life's, Life's uh, Lemon, Life's Lemon. In our first um, sermon, we talked about that, um, we talked about the sweetener uh, of the Spirit. We were in Ephesians chapter 5, the sweetener of the Spirit. Then we went to the sweetener of suffering, the sweetener of suffering there in Philippians chapter 1. We went from the sweetener of suffering to the sweetener of storms. That God has a way of instructing us, even going through the storms of life. And then last Sunday, we leaned on the sweetener of salvation. From Romans chapter 8, we know that whatever we're going through, it's all right because salvation had nothing to do with what we could do. Salvation is a finished work, finished work of Jesus Christ. And today we have another entry for um, this series of Life's Lemons. But of course, a series is not a series until I've made some more lemonade. Listen, y'all, I have been receiving calls in my mind. of people that are wanting this lemonade. And it has been such a great blessing to people um, all around for they have been able to appreciate the precision, <laughs> the precision of how I massage the lemon to get all that meat, to soften that meat up so you can get all that juice out of the lemons. People are appreciating the hands-on. <laughs> the hands-on work that I'm not using a machine. I'm using my own hands. And I'm getting in there and I'm massaging these lemons and sometimes I even pray over them. Just, Lord, <laughs> Lord, let this lemon do what it's supposed to do because there, there, there is a purpose in every lemon. And even in the lemons in your life, there are not just lemons for you to have to feel like you can endure. There is a purpose in every lemon. Would you mind encouraging somebody and saying, there's a purpose in your storm. There's a purpose in your struggle. There's a purpose in every, every lemon. And so it's, it's, it's important for us to be willing to do our part with the lemon Yet sometimes we need some help. Sometimes we need some help. So, you know, my help with the lemonade is called country time. <laughs> lemonade. See, some, some of y'all thought it was all about my lemons this whole time. I preached six sermons. You thought it was just, no, no. I added some country time to help enhance the lemon. Then I still added some sugar. Now, I don't know who put the sugar in this cup, but you didn't put enough. We'll deal with that next service. Uh, that's, 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 that's not important right now. Some of y'all are trying to, behind the doors, control how much sugar I put up in this lemonade. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, but, 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 but what I have learned and have um, matured to the place of is that uh, with the lemons that life throws at me, each one of those lemons are purposeful, each one of them, yet I've had to learn that sometimes I've got to take my hands off of the lemonade, because as long as I keep my hands on it, yeah, as long as I keep my hands on it, mm -hmm, praise him, as long as I keep my hands on it, I'm going to mess it up, because you know what I do? I'll keep adding stuff to it to make it right, but I'm forgetting that only God can make the lemonade out of the lemons. Only God can do it. One of the, uh, you know, I love studying some things about cars, and one thing I'm looking forward to with this modern technology is the car that will drive itself. You know, you have some cars that will even park itself now. And when I talk to my friends in the industry, they say, they say, you know, Mac, it's good to have those cars. But the problem is, whenever you take your hands off of it, the, the first reaction of humanity is to put your hands back on it. The problem is, when you have a handless driven car, 
when you hit a pothole, you want to put your hands on the steering wheel. But it has the technology to drive itself no matter the terrain. Can I just have to just more and say part of the problem for the evangelical church in the 21st century, we, we won't take our hands off of it. We're not willing to trust God all the way through. We still feel like we have something to add to the situation. Paul shows us in this passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 of what it looks like to be a man that functions in obedience, what it looks like to be a man that's prepared for the journey, yet he still has to take his hands off of something in his life and has to be willing to trust God to endure the pain that God allowed to have in his life. So let me ask you, are you willing to take your hands off of it? And this is a personal question. You've got to ask this within yourself and answer within yourself. With all the things you have going on, when are you going to come to the realization that some things you've got to take your hands off of? Some things you have to be willing to say, Lord, you know, I can, I, I'm not getting it right with my friend, with my loved one. So I'm literally just going to trust you with it. Because what Paul figures out and what I want to remind us of is that God offers all of us something that is sufficient. In all of our thorny situations and all of our struggles, God's grace is sufficient. So jot it down, if you will, the title of our sermon today as we deal with the sweetener is the sweetener of sufficiency. The sweetener of sufficiency. One of the um, misdirected and, and uh, presuppositions that I would say for the Christian walk is we think that every pain that we have, every struggle that we have, that is God's plan to take the pain and struggle away. Let me try it again. Many of us are living in this cloud of living that we think every obstacle that we have, it is God's plan to remove the obstacle. Let me try this out. Some of us live in this la-la state of living as a Christian that we think everybody is supposed to like us. We think everybody is supposed to agree with our vision and see the picture of what God is saying and tag right along. Well, let me, let me tell some of you just to help you out that it's coming from me and not somebody on the street. That is not God's plan. Sometimes God gives us struggles. He gives us thorns to aid us to stay focused on him. You are not going to be delivered from everything. But we'll see what Paul says, that God allowed this thorn for a purpose. Could it be you ought to change the directive of your prayers this morning and say, God, remove this. God, give me grace to sustain me through this. So the prayer cannot move, but God, give me grace to go through. So there are just um, about 20 things I want to lift up from this passage this morning. Then we'll, that was a joke. And we'll, be, we'll, we'll be done. We'll be done. We'll be done. So jot down in your notes, if you will. The first thing I want to say is sufficiency teaches us that, number one, even... Um, it teaches us to trust even when the gift is pain. Sufficiency teaches us to trust even when the gift is pain. It was read, even if I should choose to boast, I would be a fool. I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one, everybody say so no one, will think more of me than what than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. We need, my friends, God's sufficiency because God allows pain to come in our lives, yet he provides something sufficient for the pain. And we've got to learn how to trust God. Even when the gift that God gives us is pain. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, I, I don't want to make you think that Paul was sinless. Paul was not sinless. He was, he was a human being. And, and, and Paul knew something about causing pain in people's lives. Uh, before he had his moment of, of, of transformation there 
uh, he was named Saul, and, and Saul uh, loved putting Christians in custody, taking them to jail, and, and seeing difficult things happening to them. So Paul knew something about, about pain. So, so when God gifts him with a, the gift of pain, he understands what pain feels like. So let me, let, me, let me encourage somebody this morning that, 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 that for the saints, we, we got to understand that pain from God is there purposefully. Pain from God is purposeful. First of all, pain, uh, um, uh, it, it, it teaches us to, to, to refrain so that people won't get the wrong picture about us. People don't, they, they need to understand the truth about who we are. Get this. Now, Paul, out of all people, could have lived a boastful life and it would have been okay because what he would say would be true. Right? So, so, so Paul spoke at least five languages. Some of us speak English and that's, that's broken. Paul spoke five. Paul spoke five languages. Uh, um, people had a problem with Paul. People had a problem with, with the way he preached. They had a problem with the way he looked. They, didn't, they, they couldn't say nothing about his writing because his writing was clear. It was big. It was, it was wonderful. But everything else about Paul, they did not like. So just jot down your notes. Jot down so you can just read this later. Go to, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it talks about from verses 12 through 33, all the things that people had wrong uh, with, with Paul. You see, the issue what's going on in, in Paul's life is that Paul is having to stand and to talk about his, his, his credibility as an apostle. Because there were people that were, that the text called them uh, masquerading as apostles who were a- acting as if they were true preachers of the gospel, but they were preaching a different gospel. Instead of the gospel that Paul was reading, they were preaching the gospel of tradition and religion. Like, go this route. Follow the Old Testament. No, don't worry about Christ, but follow this. And so Paul comes around, and, and they don't like Paul. They don't like Paul because Paul is a, he's a Hebrew. Matter of fact, go to verse 22. 22 says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am more. Paul says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 slashes minus one. 25 says, three times I was beaten with rods. Um, once I was peddled with stones, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been consistently on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have been known hungry and thirsty. I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Paul knew something about the struggle of walking in obedience with God. He knew something about pain. Yet Paul never got the message confused with the messenger. We're going to go all the way to the top of chapter 12. Paul, Paul has an experience going into the third heaven where he experienced words that he could not say. They didn't deem themselves worthy to be spoken back here on earth. That was something that was only for heaven to understand. And Paul says, he ta- he, at the beginning of chapter 12, just go with it, in chapter 12, he, he speaks in the third person. So when he's, when he's, when he's writing this, he's writing this in third person because it was actually Paul who experienced this 14 years prior to this moment. Paul holds this revelation in his heart for 14 years because it is through this revelation and others that this revelation brought pain into Paul's life. Because Paul had to hold this in because it was not time for anyone else to hear what God had revealed to him. Now, what is different from Paul and many of us, we have one liver quiver and we write a movie, a book, and a screenplay about it. But Paul held this revelation for 14 years. Paul had reason to boast about himself. But he did not. Uh, so, so Paul teaches us how to trust God 
even when the gift is pain. Look at the text. We're not going to make up nothing. He says this, um, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn. Everybody say the thorn was a gift. Understand this, that God allowed Paul to have the thorn. Let that settle down, let that settle down in your spirit. Because many of us have, every time something evil happens, we say the devil did it. Some of y'all watched Flip Wilson's in the 70s. The devil made me do it. No, 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 no. Uh, and we, we think every bad thing that happened is sent from the devil. Understand this, that um, the, the, the devil is not in opposition with, with, with God. You can't put the devil against, it's not God versus the devil. <laughs> it, it, it's not God versus the devil. You see, God gives the devil permission to do whatever the devil does. So the devil can't do anything that God does not release him to do. So never, never, ever, never, never, ever, never, ever, never, ever say in your heart or out of your mouth that, that the devil is the opposition against God. The devil can't stand up against God. That, that's impossible. He, he, he can't do that. God is the authority. So what we have to understand is that whatever pain is in our body, God gave the devil permission to have it. Think about Job. God said, have you considered my servant Job? Understand? So, so, so God released the devil to, to allow the pain because God believes that his sons and daughters are going to rise above the pain and still be willing not to boast in themselves but to boast in him through the pain. And my friends, that's the issue with me, not, not you, but the person maybe sitting behind you. We haven't matured to the place where we can praise and boast in God while in pain. We want the pain to subside. We want to feel better. Oh, now that I feel better, I'll go to church. No, 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 no. If there's any time the saints ought to be here is when you don't feel good. You know, it blows my everlasting mind that people have the, the nerve to say, well, I just didn't feel like I so I didn't come. Are you serious? I mean, it's when you don't feel like it the hardest, that's when you have to push your way. Because as Spurgeon says, any dummy can write a song when the sun is shining. But it takes one that has a heart that's bent on God to come and praise him even when the lights are turned off at home. You see, that doesn't make sense to the culture. The culture like, man, don't make sense, man. I don't why you do that. It doesn't have to make sense to you because you don't, you don't cast pearls or swines. I'm not trying to get it to make sense to you. But if you know God as your Savior, you recognize there is peace in praising God in the midst of the storm. So, Paul said, I, I, I learned how to trust God even when this, even with this gift of pain. There have been, uh, over the years, people have always cast their opinion on, on, on what the pain was in Paul. You, you, you want me to tell you what it was? I can tell you what it was. Want me to tell you what it was? We don't know. <laughs> we have no idea what that pain was. Some had said he had gout. I mean, there are all kinds. Of, one, one philosopher said that he, his wife was his pain in this. And we don't know what his pain was. We don't know. And, and we, we, we can't add nothing to it. Now, we can, we can suppose all that, kind, but we don't know. And I think it's good that we don't know because we always try to put a label on something. See, I'm just like Paul. I got the same problem Paul had. No, 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 no. You, you're not on the same label as Paul. Uh, but just recognize that all of us have a pain. And there is a specific pain, a specific thorn that God has allowed all of us to have in our lives. And he says this, the messenger. You see it there? Uh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. I have been given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger to torment me. Finally, just know this, that whatever pain you have, it is God allowed. And if something is God allowed... It has been provided for, provided for by God. That God gives you everything you need to maintain in the pain. To maintain in the pain. Because some of the thorns we have will never be taken out. We've got to trust God in the pain. I know some of y'all will God deliver me, Lord. He's not going to deliver you from that. 
some of the pain you're going to have to endure until you see the Savior on the other side. So what do I do? Look, look, look. This is what Paul did. Look at verse 7. Paul did. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Jot this down, if you will. Sufficiency teaches us to trust. Even when the answer hurts. Even when the answer hurts. You see, this, 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 this thorn um, that was in, that Paul says, this thorn in my in my flesh. Um, this thorn is really translated to be a, a stake in the flesh. Uh, and when we say the thorn in the flesh, we, we think of like a little thorn on a rose bush. No, 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 no. This, this, the, in the original translation, it really means a stake in the flesh. So Paul was saying to us, this is not just something a little prickly that, 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 that I poke myself, I'm able to shake it off. And keep on functioning in my own ability. No, no. Paul is saying this, this, is the, this, is the, this is a big old issue. When you have a stake in your flesh and it won't come out, you got to figure out how do I live with this stake in my flesh. So what, how, we got to learn to trust God even when the answer hurts. Now there are two, two answers that we see in this, just in this one verse. Right? The first thing is, uh, uh, the answer is, when God is seemingly silent. See, the first time Paul prayed, God's answer was nothing. The second time Paul prayed, God's answer was nothing. And then when God does answer, Paul, I, if, if I use my sanctified imagination, Paul's like, huh? No, no, no. I need you to come down here with your sweet self, good, good father, all that stuff. Come down here and take this up out of me. Sometimes the answer hurts. You see, many of us are still waiting on God, and we have great expectations. We have an expectation. We believe God's going to do it, but, but we have to really, really, really settle down within the pain and ask God, God, what are you trying to reveal to me? Um, because some of this I'm never going to be able to shake. And you have to be okay with God's answer of keeping your thorn. Uh, uh, what, we, what we have to remember is that pain develops us. Pain prepares us if we see pain the right way. You see, we're not careful. Some of us will see pain as a hindrance. Like, I can't do what I need to do because I'm in pain. No, 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 ting, ting. no, 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 uh, no. Your pain is not there to prevent you. Your pain is there to prepare you. And the reality for some of us is that we never learned the previous lesson because we use pain as an excuse. And not pain to prepare us to get us ready for what's coming behind door number one. Look at nobody. Don't, don't look at anybody. Look at me. Because some of us are, are offering excuses even this morning. Like, Mac, you're saying some good stuff, and I feel something, but you don't understand the pain I have because of what people did to me. You know, I don't, and I really don't care. Because if that pain is from the Lord, that pain is purposeful. Now, the issue at hand is, are you learning the, the lesson from your pain? And you're not learning the lesson from your pain if we're using pain as an excuse not to be obedient to God. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So, 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 so it's there. Sometimes pain is there for prevention and not correction. Pain is there to develop us, to prepare us, and sometimes pain is there to keep us mm -hmm. and not to correct us. Y'all, look, I didn't make it up. Look at what the text says. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, and he did not take it away. In the verses before that, he said, God gave me a thorn in my flesh. Look at this. Paul was not a conceited preacher. I know some conceited preachers. They figured out what a, what a, excuse me, what a, an English dangling participle was. They took one class in Hebrew, one class in Greek. Arrogant. 
started preaching, now they're a bishop. Been preaching a year, now they're an apostle. We've got 15 security armed guards every Sunday. Walking around him because they impotent. They impotent. 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 They impotent. And here Paul is. Could have been the most conceited one. I would call the greatest preacher ever written about. Paul is not walking conceited. Paul recognized that the pain God allowed to have in his life was not there because he was wrong, but it was there to prevent him from becoming arrogant. See, when I see somebody arrogant, I, I know they haven't addressed the pain well. So I adjust my conversation because they haven't even addressed the pain. So why would I go down arguing with somebody that's not even under, don't even understand what's going on in their own life? They haven't addressed the pain. Because they see the pain as a hindrance, and I don't see pain as hindrance. I see pain as prevention. Listen, 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 listen. I'm, I'm not the smartest one in this, in this building. I think about everybody probably in here is smarter than me. Um, but I am willing to remain as humble as I can with what I do know. Because what the, 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 the church cannot take is another Christian that's walking in false humility. Right. See, what, what the world doesn't know how to comprehend and regurgitate is a believer that says they love God, but they're angry and mad. A believer that says, and they can quote scripture, but they, but, but they don't them. That, that, that's, a pro, that's a problem for the culture. So we can't function in false humility as if we have it together, but we're really on the stroke of us. Yeah, yeah. So listen, here I am. I got three earned master degrees from private schools, but on Friday I was here with a, with a, with a, with a uh, what are they called? What did I have? A weed eater. Now listen, listen, I'm going to tell you, listen, 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 I'm going to be honest with you. I said to myself, Seth, now I've struggled too long. Why am I out here with a weed eater? I had the whole conversation outside when I was weeding. I said, Lord, now listen here. It's been 16 years. I've done a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. I'm out here weeding. And the Lord said, now you, you, you're going to preach Sunday about a thorn. Hey. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just saying. And the Lord said to me, if your thorn right now is as a pastor, you got to weed eat and sweep some floors. You better get your happy hips out here and weed eat and sweep some floors. There is nothing that's too good for us that we cannot do for the Lord. We have not made it to any place in life where we cannot humble ourselves and weed eat. We cannot humble ourselves and sweep the floor in the Lord's house. Who in the world do you think you are that you deserve for the world to keep you on a pedestal and you're not willing enough to humble yourself? That's why you got a thorn. You haven't dealt with it. Because you think there's some things you're too good to do. And all I have to say is the devil is a liar. His whole family is a bunch of liars. And if you keep listening to him, you will miss what God is trying to prevent you from becoming. Paul said, I got this thorn so I don't become conceited. So I can maintain in this place of humility. God gave me this thorn. And it's not to be taken away. Paul dies with the same thorn, the same stake in his flesh. Woo! Paul prays three times. First two times, God didn't answer. Second time, third time, God says, this He said, listen, 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 listen. He said, my grace is sufficient. You see, the problem with some of us is that we don't hold grace to its sufficiency from its original giver. See, the, the, the concern is uh, uh, that I'm all, out, I'm all out of my place much. The concern is it, that it's really not about grace. The concern is it's about the sufficiency of God who gives the sufficient grace. 
many of us want grace, but if we get grace from people, that grace comes with strings attached. If I'm kind of you, now you remember I was 74, so it's your time to give me some grace. No, 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 no. God doesn't function like that. God, the, the, Paul says that the love that God gives doesn't keep a record of wrong. So God does not extend us grace and expect us to repent. So the next time we can praise him, oh, no, 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 no. It is the expectation of God for us just to praise him, not after the storm, but while the thorn is right there. And the sad reality for the Christian church is that we have relegated our praise to the thorn being moved, and then I'll praise God. No, no. no, I believe a real Christian, those who are really thrown off for Jesus, we have learned how to praise him with all the thorns in us. We got... Because Paul says, God said to him, listen, listen, Paul, understand this, understand this. My grace is sufficient. I'm almost done, but some, 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 sometimes... Uh, we got to learn how to trust God even when God's answer is slow. Jot that down. That may be one of the points. That, 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 that even when the answer is, is slow because look at me. Grace is slow. <laughs> look at me. Some, some of y'all look like it. You, you got some, you recognize what's slow. Great grace is slow because, because the thorn is not going to be removed. You, you got to deal with that relationship. It's not going anywhere. It's, 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 uh, but but it, it takes time for grace to flow out. Because <laughs> you got to deal with all your presuppositions. You got to deal with all this stuff. You got to deal with all the, the family. You got to deal with all that kind of stuff. So sometimes, sometimes the answer is slow. See, this, this, this is what I figured out about, about God, that I preached about God, is that the, the, they said to me, it's, it's it got to be slow and steady. So as, as I continue to open myself in honoring God with a life that's obedient, God gives me and allows me to see the sufficiency of that slow grace. You see, because the pain doesn't just go away one moment at a time. Yet one moment at a time, the pain subsides. It's not that it ever goes, but God's grace apparently satisfies the pain moment by moment. You see, we, we, we want God just to pull the dagger out, but that would be too much for you. That'd be too much. Can you imagine if when you have a stake in your body and someone just pulls it out, do you know what happens? Blood bleed out. It's, it's, it's too much. Tell me, tell, say back at me, it's too much. So, 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 and so since God knows it's too much for us, God satisfies the pain and the irritation one moment <laughs> at a time. See, the reality is we got to be willing to trust God because the pain is, listen, when you have some real pain, some of y'all don't think about pain, it's, it's throbbing and it's hard. Think about this. Think about this. Think about this. Okay, so, 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 um, the pearl is the product of pain in an oyster. The pearl is the product of pain in an oyster. And so, so you have the, the, something irritates the oyster, and over time, depending on the pain and the, the pressure, will determine the pearl that comes out. All right, so the, let me talk to the, y'all missed that, the balcony. So, so, so just, like, just, like, just like the oyster, when you have the irritation of that sand, the more pressure that's applied in that irritation, the greater the pearl is that comes out of the oyster. So, 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 so could, it be, could it be that God is allowing these hard lemons to come your way so you can take the pressure of these lemons and really make some doggone divine lemonade? Yeah. Could it be that God wants you, instead of allow, trying to miss the lemons, to catch the lemons? Catch them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the lemons. Squeeze the lemons and make the lemonade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is not, this is not divine dodgeball. We're trying to miss. No, 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 no. Catch it. Catch the, catch the lemons. Catch the lemons. Cut the massage. Cut the, and use the lemons and make some lemonade. This is, grace is slow sometimes. 
But if you honor the process, everybody say, God is developing me. If you honor the process, you can take what God is doing and see how God works all of it together. That's the last point. Look, look at the last part of the, of the verse. He says, uh, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Everybody say my weakness. And he says, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Everybody say rest. Uh, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, uh, insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Listen, there's something about reading the scripture, so y'all read it with me. Is it on the screen? Y'all read it. Go, go back to verse, go back to verse number, be part of verse 9. Start there, therefore, read it out loud, ready, and go. Therefore, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Read it for yourself. Read it so that you feel the conviction of God's word. Ready? Begin. Ready and go. If you, if you really understand this, will you say back at me, Lord, I thank you for my thorn. You see, it's, it's, it's in this thorn that God is trying to teach us some things, everybody. God wants us, want us to learn that we can trust in him while we endure the thorn. I said it once and I said it again, every thorn is not going to be removed some thorns will be there and will last within us for our life here on earth. So we've got to trust God while we're dealing with the pain of our thorn. All of us are in a thorny situation today. All of us have some thorny situations. All of us, all of us. And the thorn is, 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 is all over the place. Some of the thorns is we brought on to ourselves. Some of the thorns... Um, that uh, others have brought on to us. But that's not the kind of thorn that Paul was in. Paul was dealing with a thorn that God gave him purposefully. You see, people uh, that are in our lives, yeah, they're, they're, they're nice people and they do some things that hurt us, but they're not really the thorn. People are not your thorn. I hope they help somebody. There is no human being that is a thorn in your life. Not the kind of thorn that Paul is dealing with. You see, Paul had all kind of haters around him. He didn't call his haters his thorn. It's not people. This is a thorn that God gives him to keep him focused on God. It's not people. It's not stuff. This is a God-given thing. So I want to encourage you today that the, the, these, the, the thorn that God has given you, write this down if you will, uh, 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 the, the sufficient teaches us to trust because strength is produced from weakness. That's it. Because strength is produced from weakness. Paul says this, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So, so, so if we're really going to own the fact that strength is produced from weakness, we have to appreciate our weakness. You have to learn to appreciate the weak areas in your life where God is trying to develop you. Many of us have been trained with all these leadership conferences that we should find uh, that we don't worry about uh, uh, the weak areas. Just keep building on your strength areas. And there is a piece of that that is true. Yet when it comes to the spiritual things that God has placed in our world, there is a weak area that we have to find where it is because it's in that space and place that God is going to use his strength to strengthen you for his purpose and design. So you say, Matt, what, what you're saying? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. That, that, that Paul gives another list of areas of weakness. He said, in insults, hardships, yeah. don't look at it, yeah. in persecutions, and in difficulties. And if anybody could talk about insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties, it was Paul. If anybody had a history of dealing with inserts, persecutions, 
hardships, it was Paul. And if Paul could say that in those areas of weakness, I'm strong, the same God that enthused and kept Paul is the same God that enthuses and will keep you. So we've got to learn how to appreciate our areas of weakness because it's in that space, that space that we become strong in. <laughs> See, if you don't know your area of weakness, you're just going through things. You just, you just did it with life, how life comes. No, 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 no. It's more to it than, about life than just that. God wants us to own and hone in on those areas of weakness because it's in that spot that he will allow us to see the, the power of Christ and become strong in. Listen, the, the issue is not a, a specific person. The issue is you don't know how to be in relationship with anybody. See, it's not one person that you have an issue with. You have an issue with communicating with everybody. Some folks just like you more than others. They're willing to deal with it. That's right, that's right. See, we, we, we want to point. It's, it's not just that one thing. There's a bigger picture to it. What is your area of weakness? Your area of weakness is communication. Right, right, right. <laughs> but we want to we put it on a person. No, it's, he's my sheep. No, no, no. It ain't them. It's me, oh, Lord. Paul says, what I learned, I learned to boast in God regardless because I recognize what my pain, this thorn, is here for. Yeah. God allows this pain to happen in Paul's life so that Paul would learn, mature to the place. That he recognized that it's in the weak areas of his life. When he allows God to settle in, he becomes stronger. He becomes stronger. So could it be the day that God wanted you to be here to read these particular verses so you can ask yourself and ask you the same question, what am I to do with this thorn, with this dagger, with this stake in my side? I believe the answer is clear to us. Boast in the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think it's pretty clear. I, I, think, I think it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear. Because we recognize as we boast, we become stronger because now... Our weakness has now gained strength. So that the reality for us as God's sons and daughters is what God is expecting for from all of us as we deal with our thorns is to make our boast in Him all the more louder while we're going through this. Get this. The world needs to see us as an example of how the church praises God, boasts in God with thorns in us. That's why people, some people in the world are not coming to church. They're looking at you. They're like, listen, I got it going on. I got this over here and this over here. And you're expecting me to come to where you are. So that means soon I'm going to be acting like you. I'm going to start looking like you. I got it good right Everything's good right now. I got it good. But you want me to come to church and you talk about the church online. You talk about them same people at the water fountain. Would you want me to come with you to your job? No, I'm going to stay over here. It's, it's, we party. We're having a good time over, over, over here. Uh, and so so, so the, re, the, the reality is we got to learn how to make the boast in the right thing. So it's easy to boast when things are, when people are on your nerves and make you frustrated. But how about when frustration rises, you start boasting the Lord that much louder? Listen, listen, Paul says, I will boast in the Lord. So instead of giving in to the frustration, giving in to the pain, how about make your praise from the pain louder to the God that wants to hear it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm done. I'm done. So the question is, what are you going to do with the pain? What are you going to do with your pain this morning? What are you going to do with the pain? What are you going to do with the frustration? What are you going to do with the pain that God has allowed to come your way? I pray that while the pain is in your system, is in your hands, that you, instead of putting those hands down on your side, you raise those hands to the Lord. And if you feel good, you start beating them together. Why? Because God's grace is sufficient. God has supplied for you everything you need to handle and maintain the pain areas in your life. So the question is, what will you do with the pain? Listen, you can't do nothing with the pain. You can't, you can't take the pain away, but you can praise the God that brought it in your life.
That's all I want you to get this morning. That instead of giving in and, and, and allowing the pain to take over, trust God and praise him while the pain is going on. And the reason why you can do it is because Christ satisfied the pains of the entire world. By dying on that cross, Christ satisfied it. So in your weakness, God makes you strong. I'm done with that. I was a story about a little boy named Jim. His father was, 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 a, was an electrician. He loved to tinker and he, he loved to make things. And, and Jim wanted his dad to build him a robot. So that Christmas, Jim had two boxes under the tree. Both boxes were, were wrapped. And his father said, Jim, whichever box you want to open up first, you could open up one and open up the second. So, of course, Jim chose the biggest box. And in that box, there was a robot that Jim's dad had made just for Jim. His father said, Jim, don't forget about the second box over here. And Jim said, Dad, I'll get to it. But Jim just was so in love with this robot. This robot did everything Jim told it to do. This robot would make up Jim's bed. This robot would go and play fetch with his dog. This robot did everything that Jim told it to do. But after Jim had played with the robot for so long, the robot started malfunctioning. Jim told the robot to go and get the stick, and the robot said, you get the stick. <laughs> Everything Jim told the robot to do, the robot would turn it back on Jim. Jim said, robot, clean my room. The robot said, you clean your own room. The robot was malfunctioning. And so uh, what Jim, he remembered his dad saying, Jim, don't forget to open up the second box. What Jim did not know that it was that in the second box was the manual for the robot. But had Jim opened up the second box, Jim could have figured out how to fix the robot from the beginning. But Jim kept his hands on it and kept trying to misguide the robot, tell the robot to do some things and trying to get into his system and change the system, but he couldn't change the system. So Jim had fallen out with the robot. But when he opened up the second box... He figured out that his dad had written a whole manuscript of how to handle when the robot messes up. Listen, I want to leave this one. God has given us what we call his word. And his word is the manuscript that if we take the time and open it up, it will remind us that God's grace is sufficient. The question is, what are you going to do with it? We've read it. We've espoused it. What are you going to do with the truth that God is speaking to your hearts now? And it's my prayer that you will choose to trust God to know that his grace is sufficient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the reality of your scriptures. We thank you so much for the reality of the observation in your scriptures. For we know that you don't love Paul more than you love us. So if you're willing to give Paul the grace he needs for his thorn, his dagger, his, the stake in his side, we know that your grace is enough for us. So on this morning, Father, we thank you for showing yourself once again to us that your grace is enough. So Father, in the audience of your sons and daughters, we thank you for speaking For as we prepare to go home from this place, we all have a choice to make. And for some of us, the choice is not about salvation because we've already received that free gift. But the choice is, will we allow the power of that gift to reign and lead our lives or will we give in to the pain? And it's my prayer that we've made the decision, Father, we're not going to give in to the pain, we're going to give in to you. Because we recognize that your grace is sufficient. And the idea of sufficiency is that it satisfies and it never stops satisfying. It never stops satisfying the pain that you allow us to endure. So, God, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for the sufficiency of it. And we surely appreciate it. So, as... We spend this last couple of minutes in prayer. If God is speaking to your heart and you need 
you're asking and you need special prayer to partner in with you for the pain that you have in your body as God has given you truth about that pain would you come so that we can pray together would you trust God that in your weakness in this pain he has the power to make you strong enough to endure it because it's not going away some of this pain would be with us And it's only God's grace that will allow us to endure. So, Father, we thank you. If you're needing prayer, if you're asking the Lord to be your Savior for the very first time, I'd love for you to come so that we can partner and celebrate with you. For the decision you're making to give God your heart. For in your weakness, God makes you strong. So will you trust him today? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks for he has given Jesus Christ, his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks, for he has given Jesus Christ, his Son. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us Say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us, give thanks. We're on our way home. Give thanks. Song says again, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks for He has given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks for He has given Jesus Christ. Come on, stand with me. His son, and now, stand with me, let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, come on, stand with me, because of what the Lord has done for us, and now, let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am because of what the Lord has done. One more time for us. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor. 